We have, I think this is the fix. This is what they do, the weekly fix. That's what it is. There is a lot going on here. We have Bethesda defend Starfield, billion dollar lawsuit with PlayStation, and more. And by more, there is a bunch more sections. How's so it let's going, go everybody? over it. I'm Stella Chung, and this is the weekly fix, the show where we round up all the gaming and entertainment headlines you may have this week. We're yeah, no. Week off, and we've got a gem packed show for you. Everybody's we posting the, the longest Rocket videos possible. Reviews of Starfield. Nearly half of CDPR is working on The Witcher 4. A major PlayStation lawsuit is moving forward in court. Marvel's movies are in for an interesting 2024. And there was a major shift at Lucasfilm. <sighs> shift at Lucasfilm. <sighs> That's not even half of it. I wasn't kidding when I said we had a packed show for you. So, yeah. Without wasting it looks any huge. more time, like there's a let's lot. Get to the first story. The facts. The 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 facts. Bethesda has taken the unusual step for a AAA video game developer of responding to negative responded reviews. Responded to negative as part reviews. Of that I've seen Amy this. Hodgetts, I've seen this. Of the Microsoft-owned company have been replying to negative reviews on Valve's platform since early November, amid Starfield's mixed user review rating of 69. percent Many of the this game got like 10 out of 10, 8 out of 8. Like this like, one, posted on November 6th from a player with 56 hours in Starfield. Boring and overrated. There's a wide universe to explore. Filled I've seen this review. Planets. I understand they have to do that to sell you on the idea that this is a whole universe, but that doesn't make the game more fun. You can land on any planet and explore the copy-pasted locations. You will see the exact same locations from one end of the universe to the other and everywhere in between. As wide as the ocean and as deep as a puddle. You can explore everywhere, but why would you want to? This review sparked a response from someone called Bethesda Kraken Developer, who yep. signed off their post as coming from Bethesda Customer Support. Watch this. Greetings. Thank you for taking the time to leave a review for Starfield. We are sorry that you do not like landing on different planets and are finding many of them empty. Some of Starfield's planets were meant to be empty by design, but that's not boring. Quote, when the astronauts went to the moon, there was nothing there. They certainly weren't bored. End quote. The Damn. Of Starfield's exploration is to the feeling of smallness in players and make you feel overwhelmed. You can continue to explore and find worlds that do have resources you need or hidden huh. in to look That was the Never stop exploring. reaction, I guess. Support. That was the response. Bizarrely, the response quotes Ashley Chang, Bethesda's managing director, who uttered the phrase, when the astronauts went to the moon, there was nothing there. They certainly weren't bored. In a New York Times feature published ahead of Starfield's September launch. But it's not like this is some famous quotation. Why are they quoting their coworker? Here's a more recent response, again from the busy Bethesda crowd. Right, let's see this one. I don't know if I've seen this one. Starfield player with over 76 hours on. Yeah, that's in real life. It's a game. You can fly. Yeah. You can shoot. You can mine. You can loot. Starfield is an RPG with hundreds of hours of quests to complete and characters to meet. Most quests will also vary on your character's skills and decisions, massively changing the outcome of your playthrough. Try creating different characters with backgrounds and characteristics that clash or are the opposite of previous characters. You will feel like you are playing a totally different game. Put points in different skills from a character you've previously created, and you are now faced with completely different decisions to make and difficulties to encounter. There are so many layers to Starfield that you will you find posted things this never last. What do you mean? After playing for hundreds of hours, so Bethesda is responding to reviews that say Starfield is boring by saying, "Nah." -uh. While indie video pretty much game that's that's, to that's the response all the time. Big publishers like Bethesda rarely get stuck in, which makes these responses noteworthy. Why would Bethesda bother? It may yeah. be to your Starfield, Starfield is in a more mad. positive direction, mindful of that troublesome mixed user review rating. Starfield is currently the lowest rated Bethesda game ever on Valve. Oh, Valve. yeah, that's Fallout true. 76 currently has a mostly positive user review rating of 76%, if you're wondering. And management will no doubt be keen to address that. Of course, there's a risk that comes from responding to negative reviews, particularly when you use them to insist landing I know, on the planet but isn't boring. What's his name? Who's the head of Bethesda? That dude was so excited for this game to come out, and he made everybody else super excited to come out. I know, I saw it. The Ted Howard, has a Starfield yeah. Post-launch story expansion pack in the works called Shattered Space, and development chief Todd Howard told IGN in an interview earlier this year that Bethesda has released a lot of add-on content for the space exploration game. Moving on, nearly half of CD Projekt Red is now working on The Witcher 4, codenamed Polaris, following the release of the Cyberpunk 2077 expansion Phantom Liberty. Confirmation arrived during CD Projekt's latest earnings report, which indicated... So they are working on The Witcher 4. ...just under 50% of its staff were working on the highly anticipated sequel as of October 31st. There you go. The CEO also confirmed the company expects more than 400 developers will be working on Polaris by mid-2024. The report also has more than 25% of developers... Witcher 4? ...in transfer as they transition... I know, but I'm not going to be able to play it. 
Yeah, bro. said previously that many of those team members would join Polaris alongside the Cyberpunk sequel, Codename Orion, and other projects. As for its development stage, CD Projekt Red hasn't said anything since it confirmed Polaris had entered pre-production back in May of 2020. Like off-stream, yeah. So it's exciting yeah. to know that production is really ramping up on the sequel to one of the most beloved games of all time. Do I need to play Witcher 3, or do I need to play Witcher 1 and 2 before 3? Sony has announced that LEGO 2K Drive, Power Wash Simulator, and Sable will be coming to the service. LEGO 2K Drive Just is an three. open world arcade style racer, kind of like Forza okay. Horizon, but with the ability to transform your car into the terrain, going from speed 2K Drive, to LEGO, cars, like Ubisoft's The Crew 2, and no thanks. hot swapping system. We really dug this game, giving it an 8 out of 10. In 8 our out of 10, if damn. I completely forgot about this game, I did too. It might be because it dropped a week after Tears of the Kingdom did. And uh, I think a lot of people were busy building wacky contraptions in that. But it seems like a perfect family-friendly game to play over the holiday break. If you want something a little slower paced, Power Wash Simulator is exactly... Power Wash the Simulator. You clean things with a power washer. You're given jobs cleaning things like dirty trains... You used to play Lego and Racer and on PS1. Players. I did. Power Simulator is also known for its bizarre collapse. Ever played this? Recently, you were given Super the fun. Of Best game ever. Traveling DeLorean Power Wash. And the Hill Valley Clock Tower from Back to the Future. Other Absolutely. crossovers include Power Washing Lara Croft's Mansion from Tomb Raider and cleaning up the Seventh Heaven Bar from Final Fantasy VII. All right, the mansion I get, but I mean, come on, dive bars are supposed to be dirty. That's part of the charm. And rounding out the headlining trio of games is Sable, an adventure game with a heavy emphasis on puzzle solving and Why do I know that name, the game Sable? Is all about the vibes. There's no fail state, no combat. Oh, that looks and no good. Objective. I you like the, the, the design. The desert world rendered in a very striking minimalistic art style. I they like it. it. A 7 out of 10 praising the visuals but criticizing it for some bugs. But Hey, it's received a few updates since its original launch back in 2021, so your mileage may vary. Excited to try any of these games? Let me know in the comments. Yeah, Sable looks good. Last year, a lawsuit was filed against Sony claiming the company abused its position I this. as the main seller of digital games on the PlayStation right. Store by charging a 30% commission to developers and publishers. How's that going? Despite the efforts of Sony's lawyers, a London tribunal is allowing it to move forward. This legal action is also on behalf of customers, too. On a website that details the lawsuit, the FAQ page has a section that reads, Sony has been exploiting its UK customers by charging them too much for PlayStation digital games and in-game content via its control over the entire PlayStation ecosystem. They called it anti-competitive, the same label Microsoft was attempting to shed in its acquisition battle for Activision Blizzard. When announcing the lawsuit last year, consumer rights advocate Alex Neal claimed that gaming is the biggest entertainment industry in the UK Truth. above all other media. It is. Going on to say, many vulnerable people rely on gaming for community and connection. The actions of Sony are costing millions of people who can't afford it, particularly yeah, when they're in the real. middle of a cost of living crisis and the consumer purse is being squeezed like never before. The yeah. estimated damages per individual over the last six years range from 67 pounds to 562 pounds, which is about 79 to 664 US dollars. This excludes interest, which the lawsuit claims adds up to 5 billion pounds total. Neil said, with this legal action, I am standing up for the millions of UK people who have been unwittingly overcharged. We Damn. believe Sony has abused its position and ripped off its customers. Hell yeah. So about the lawsuit for Take them down. With the news that it's moving forward, you can expect to hear more about it in the coming weeks. We'll keep you posted as the story develops. So sticking with the theme of players preferring old games over shiny new ones, the 17-year-old real-time strategy game Empire at War. Empire at War is still. I don't think I ever played that. At least in 2006, Empire at War takes place. We've in seen some of this, haven't we? Original trilogies, but it's the multiplayer that's kept people around. Online functionality died in 2014, but then was revived through the Steam version with Workshop support. Earlier this month, developer Petroglyph updated Empire at War with a maintenance patch that made minor bug fixes, player balance changes, and and optimized performance. The latest patch after that update converted both Empire at War and its expansion, Forces of Corruption, from I remember hearing about this. Where did I hear about this at? Solving a lot of memory bugs and crashes. Petroglyph also addressed multiplayer out of sync issues and numerous gameplay fixes, addressing balance and incorrect unit behavior. It's incredibly sweet to see the developer come back to a beloved game to give it a few tweaks and love after all of these years. There's around 2,000 concurrent players on Steam at any moment. So, yeah, I, I've seen this already. An issue. Are we watching things we've already seen? If Petroglyph has something up their sleeve with a potential remake or sequel. Hopefully, Empire War fans can get some surprising updates next year. 
Speaking of Marvel games, at Fan Expo San Francisco this weekend, Tony Todd, the voice actor for Venom in Spider-Man 2, said Insomniac only used 10% of his character's dialogue in the Damn. game. A clip from Evan Filarka at Fan Expo caught Todd explaining that some of his voice work for Venom may be saved for the future. Spoilers ahead ah. if you haven't played or haven't finished Spider-Man 2. Just skip ahead if you're worried about any story reveals. During the same panel, Todd said he recorded lines for when Miles Morales had the symbiote. Those scenes were obviously scrapped, so fans are now speculating this could lead to a potential spin-off or DLC. This would line up with Insomniac stating they wouldn't be against making 10%. a spin-off if fans really wanted it after seeing how fans reacted to Spider-Man 2. John Paquette, senior narrative director at Insomniac, said, we're going to listen to the fans and we're going to ask ourselves, okay, what do the fans really want? We'll kind of talk about stuff after we've all had time to sleep and take vacations. Hopefully next year we'll hear more about potential DLC and spinoffs, but I think we won't have to wait too long before getting more Venom in Spider-Man 2. The original game got three DLC chapters, so I can't imagine the super three would DLCs. be given the same treatment, even if the DLC formula is tweaked. I remember that. Much. It's about time for a quick break, but when we come back, quick we're looking break. into what a possible hell? GTA. What's up with the MCU and on Final Fantasy 3, and also why Sony is going to release more Marvel content in 2025 to GTA 5 Story Expo 06 debut trailer early go. next month. Further evidence has emerged of scrap plans for additional GTA 5 story content as possible well. evidence of two. cut GTA 5 VGC. DLC. The latest news comes from the alleged leak of a database file for GTA 5, which is being dug into by the community. Now, according to Twitter user Billzy Liam GTA, who credits GTA data miners, this file includes reference to the unreleased Bully Bull 2. The uninitiated Bully is Rockstar's Damn. six game about a juvenile delinquent. And who played Bully? Bully was good. Of Bullworth Academy. The fans have long called for a sequel, which was once in development at Rockstar's New England studio in the late 2000s, sometime around the release of GTA 4 story expansion and Red Dead Redemption. Now, Bill Z. Liam GTA adds there's a reference to GTA 5 playable character Trevor with a jetpack, which suggests story mode content was repurposed into GTA Online. Now, in 2018, Rockstar finally unveiled GTA Online's Doomsday Heist missions oh, alongside wow. Thruster, a jetpack that's still exclusive to the multiplayer mode to this day. Now, it didn't take long for, of course, modders to add that jetpack into GTA 5 story mode, of course. Yeah, of course. Awesome. Now, GTA 5 never did receive significant story DLC, despite the constant call from fans. Now, Rockstar instead focused on a money printer GTA Online. Which of course the they did. On from GTA 5's initial release is still going strong. Now, meanwhile, Twitter user GlowDevs reveals a reference to CNC, which is thought to relate to the cops and crooks mode that was reportedly intended for GTA Online. Now, all this relates to past content, of course, and with Rockstar's focus now firmly on GTA 6, it's doubtful it will ever... Yeah, weren't they supposed to do, like, they're supposed to work with the role community? Bully fans from a GTA? ...what might have been had Rockstar taken a different path and released GTA 5 Story Mode DLC, as well as Bully 2. Uh, at least, you know, there's finally an official reveal of GTA 6 to look forward to. Now, the debut trailer is due in early December, and you and we can expect to find plenty of coverage right here at IGN. And finally today, Walking Dead fans rise up because the Walking Dead Destinies launched last week with... Contender for the worst game of 2023. Yet another worst game of 2023. Yikes. Contender from the same company. Get this, the same company that published last month's disastrous Skull Island Rise of Kong. Now, The Walking Dead Destinies is developed by little-known Brazilian studio Flux Games and published by Minneapolis-based Game Meal Entertainment. Now, last month, the publishers... Oh, yeah, Rise of Kong. I remember when they came out. ...went viral for its terrible visuals, gameplay, and cutscenes. Now, our review awarded it a 3 out of 10, calling it, quote, this isn't for me, quote, a boring, buggy, totally unambitious game that isn't even interesting in its failures. Damn. Damn. 
<laughs> yeah, for real. Anyways, the Walking Dead Destinies is a fifty-dollar third-person action adventure that retells the story. Fifty dollars. The Walking Dead show, but lets players change the course of its history. You can make an enemy of the governor, or you can recruit him to your cause. Now, whatever you pick, you're meant to live with the consequences. And it definitely seems like anyone who buys the game will be doing just that. Like seriously, I mean, the cutscenes in this video game, it's just stills. It's stills with some, with some particle effects floating by to add, give it some motion and like some, some push-ins and some push-outs. That's all it is. It's, a, it's not worth the 50 bucks. Damn. To break it down a little bit more, the reaction to that sucks. mirrors that of Rise of Kong. Like the visuals are PS2 era level and the game That's what I was thinking. is laughable. Like its cutscenes are as static as they come. Like huh? just a snippet. <laughs> what? Are you talking to me? No! <laughs> Damn, 50 bucks for that. Well, consider yourselves warned. Now, yes, I do. Destinies launched last week on PlayStation 5, PlayStation 4, Xbox Series X, and S, Xbox One, and Nintendo Switch. I think it's also... You're talking to me. <laughs> you can check over there if you really want I know, to. I always say that. Also, a PC version via Steam is due out December 1st. Square Enix has shared a ton of new... Yes, I do. ...and screenshots for Final Fantasy VII Rebirth alongside a Red 13 narrated trailer. Well, the story is just a story so far catch up that will be included in the game's main menu. Recap for trailer for Final Fantasy... ...on Final Fantasy VII Remake. Seven? Square Enix shared plenty of other bits of information too. What's the one you guys keep telling me to play? Regions, ...characters, and more. That a developer is it seven? Both active and classic battle modes will return in Rebirth, again letting players choose between fast-paced action or slower-paced decision-making. Now, the sequel will get a new difficulty mode, however, with dynamic joining easy and normal to allow for further player customization. Now, while Rebirth is a remake of the second chunk of Final Fantasy VII, just like the Part 1 remake, it will feature a wealth of new characters, five of which Square Enix has detailed today. Now, I'll read off the official character synopsis for you. Broden is the owner and operator of the inn at Calm. He bears a grudge against Shinra, offering to help Cloud and friends escape their would-be corporate captors. His gaunt appearance may be due to his recent bout with an unknown illness. Rhonda is the mayor and sheriff of Under Junon. Her home, once a prosperous fishing village, fell into decline after Shinra constructed a military fortress overhead and a deep sea Mako reactor offshore. Despite Cloud and Friends' status of alleged terrorists, Rhonda still allows them to pass through her town. Priscilla is a cheerful young girl. I don't know any of these people, bro. Junon often seen swimming with the dolphin she trains. The offshore Mako reactor has contaminated the surrounding waters and Priscilla fears for the safety of her dolphin friend and other aquatic creatures. Another new character is Billy, the grandson of Bill and owner of a chocobo ranch in Grasslands. This young ranch hand kindly offers to teach Cloud and company the ropes of chocobo wrangling on the condition that they patronize his sister's shop. The fifth and final character revealed by Square Enix is Chloe, Billy's younger sister. She runs a shop on the ranch where she sells crafting materials and other curios. Warm and kind-hearted, she engages politely with Cloud and company and is grateful for their patronage. At the same time, she is worried about her brother's fixation on making money. Switching focus back to the main party of Cloud, Aerith, and so on. Oh, Phoenix they had a lot to say about that Final Fantasy VII. ...would make their debut in Rebirth. Now, these are powerful attacks in which two characters team up to perform with more abilities unlocking as players level up their party. Cloud can launch Tifa toward an enemy to attack in tandem with Relentless Rush, for example, while Barrett can throw in Red 13 at high velocity to perform Overfang. The synergy skills have also been added with these providers. So it's still turn-based? I thought it wasn't turn-based anymore. Damage. Cloud and Aerith 
can gather their strength to team up and perform a charged magical attack called Spellblade, while Cloud and Barrett can team up for a forward charge this looks turn -based. dash that guards the pair before unleashing a three-hit combo on an enemy. Whew. Now, Rebirth's February 29th release date is getting ever so closer, and fans are finally learning more and more about the game. The Square Enix has previously confirmed it will feature new story content centered on Zack and perhaps even incorporated backstory for Sephiroth included in the mobile game Final Fantasy VII Ever Crisis. Now, as you may know, Venom 3 has resumed Venom 3 tease with this image about a week ago. I'm okay with that. The photo was snapped by the actor. Oh, I seen this, set yeah. In celebration of everyone getting back together to bring Marvel fans more Venom. Now we have further updates from the actor as he went back onto the social media platform with further details on where production stands on the third entry. Now he goes on to talk about how proud he is of the team, his writing partner, and the entire cast and crew, which he considers friends and family. Now the first line in the post- I think they picked the perfect Free, person the for dance. Venom. Now him posting this might indicate that this is the final chapter in the solo Venom films. Now that obviously doesn't mean this will be the last time we'll be seeing the Marvel character as we know Sony is building what it's calling the Spider-Man Cinematic Universe. Now, while Sony seems to be focused on releasing more Marvel-related movies in 2024, Disney surprisingly seems to be more concentrated on pushing out Disney Plus-related Marvel content. Now, so far, Sony has Madam Web, Craven the Hunter, and Venom 3 all releasing in theaters sometime in 2024. Whereas Disney's Marvel Studios only has Deadpool 3 slated to release next year. So Sony's got three movies Disney coming out next year. Streaming schedule, there's five <clears throat> coming in 2024. Marvel Zombies, Spider-Man Freshman Year, Agatha, Darkhold Diaries, X-Men 97, and Echo. Now, I'm excited for three out of five of those. Now, I'll let y'all guess which yeah. one. Yeah. Here's a hint. They're all animated. Now, Disney's <laughs> movies have nice. seen lots of shakeups, and that's without taking into consideration the actors and writer strikes earlier this year. Now, a great deal of MCU's yeah. movies suffered setbacks due to script rewrites, directors and writers leaving projects, and many other real world factors, which saw Marvel Studios pushing back the majority of its MCU slate. And honestly, maybe it's for the betterment of this particular. No, movie. the strike was caused by them not making enough money. It's been a strong year at the box office for Marvel Studios. So the so director, they said that they weren't being paid enough. Actors were saying they weren't being paid enough. And then directors started jumping on board saying they weren't getting paid enough either. With its three Marvel related films, while we'll be getting quite a few Disney Plus shows to keep Marvel fans interested in what's to come from Marvel. And for all those Spider-Verse fans out there, Beyond the Spider-Verse currently is not on Sony's 2024 release calendar which means it likely won't be hitting that March 2024 release and presumably delayed. Now, we'll, of course, keep you updated as news develops. Now, in other news, give it up to Blumhouse's latest... Five Nights at Freddy's! Five Nights at Freddy's it was a great movie. production company's great movie. grossing movie globally. Now, the horror film based on the popular video game franchise is inching ever so closer to $300 million at the global box office. Damn, $300 office. million. Dollars. Good job. Quite a handful of negative reviews. The fandom is strong and showing... can't do that. ...support Freddy Fazbear and his psychotic animatronic friends. Now, Blumhouse has been on quite a box office tear these past couple of years with 2022's The Black Phone and this year's Megan proving to be quite successful for the company. Megan was okay. Megan wasn't really that good to be honest. Here's hoping we'll see a FNAF 2 in live action. Oh, we will. They've already said there's going to be three movies. A lot of Star Wars nerds already is about to be even more involved with that galaxy far, far away as he's stepping into a new role of Chief Creative Officer at Lucasfilm. The announcement comes by way of an article by Vanity Fair in which Filoni explains how this changes his involvement, saying, quote, in the past, in a lot of projects, I would be brought into it. I would see it after it had already developed in good ways. He continues, in this new role, it's open up to basically everything that's going on. When we're planning the future of what we're doing now, I'm involved at the inception phase. Nice. Filoni will work alongside Lucas film president Kathleen Kennedy and head of development Carrie Beck. For the sound of things, it seems like he might be playing a similar role to Marvel Studios' Kevin Feige. How that'll pan out, we'll have to wait and see. Filoni's work does speak for itself, though. 
Most recently, Filoni oversaw the Disney Plus series Ahsoka, whose titular character he co-created for The Clone Wars, and which featured a number of other characters from Rebels, which he's also the co-creator of. Filoni worked closely on The Clone Wars with George Lucas before the Star Wars creator sold the company, and The Mandalorian is a result of close collaboration between Filoni and Jon Favreau, so he's definitely earned his new job. There are a handful of Star Wars movies in various states of development, one of which Filoni is currently attached to direct, and his new role at Lucasfilm certainly makes it seem like it has better chances of actually coming out, which is more than you can say for a lot of the Star Wars movie projects that have been announced or heavily rumored over the last decade. Aside from movies, we've got some more Star Wars shows to look forward to in the coming year, between Andor Season 2, The Acolyte, and Skeleton Crew, all of which are expected to hit Disney Plus sometime in 2024. I'm Stella Chung, and that was your weekly fix. That was the we'll weekly fix. Saturday with more of the biggest gaming and entertainment news. So Damn, now, they're making more Star Wars shows? What are they making more Star Wars shows on? Like, who? Anyway, that was a weekly fix. Good news, bad news, news we already knew, right? <laughs>